Anyway, we're on live. You can speak, though. We're on live. So the question was, I was asked a question about how can I be convinced that the observer experiences death? Yeah, is that the question? So along those lines. How did you come to that? Right. Yeah. Oh, how did I come? How, how did I come to the observer? Come to yeah, the yeah. Knowing that the observer doesn't die, the observer well, observes what dies. Look, look. I mean, it's it's kind of um, well. It's, I'll answer it a different way. Like um, to answer it to answer it in, in a different way. The um, the um, when you meet an enlightened teacher you get the energetic transference from their, from their aura that um, uh, and so you, you get what, uh, what's called a spiritual knowing you get a spiritual knowing in your, in, in your aura like when someone who's been through the death of their ego says it to you and you're in their presence there is an energetic transference which is spiritual which means you know you know, the, the, and it's passed down as well. I mean, this happens on another scale in 12-step groups. You know, when, I, when, I, when someone who's recovered from alcohol says to someone drinking, look, you know, I did this, and this works. There's something, you know, they pass on, if the person's open, an energetic transmission, and they know, they know that it's a deal. So, and I've been doing the Observer, you know, for now 18 years. You know, I've done a lot of observing of things. So it becomes kind of like there's a, what I call a knowingness that I cannot be an object. There's a knowingness I'm not an object. And there's a knowingness that I'm not a transitory passing phenomena. Because if you do the, the observer for 18 years, I mean, I mean, it's this simple. I mean, it's kind of obvious to me, right? You cannot be an object. You cannot be an object. I mean... Um, if anyone believes they're this pen, it's because they're identified. They find it very interesting and fascinating, and they have a kind of a relationship with it. When, when something is meaningless, when there's no relationship with something, to, you, uh, if there's completely no relationship with something, you do not see it. You do not experience it. Okay? So... Like, no one noticed that that book behind me was read. Nobody here knew that. That book in that bookshelf was read because it's not a thing that the ego identifies with. When the ego does not identify with something, it does not register. It does not exist for the ego. The ego only registers things which are interesting or are important or it gives value to, or it wants to identify with. So, <clears throat> like, no one noticed that, that there, was, there was a little red bud in that flower. See, no one noticed that, because it's not registered, because it's not interesting. Like, if I was a donut addict, I'd remember there was a donut in the room, but someone who's um, an alcoholic would remember there was a vodka bottle in the room, mm. you know? You only register that which is interesting to the ego. Like I would go out of this room and I'd say to my best friend over here, do you see that donut on the table? And he might say, no, I didn't see the donut. I saw the gold pen, you know. And we didn't even see the same things in the room. And uh, that's because things exist when there's an identification with them. And things which, where there's no identification, they don't exist. So I often, I mean, I haven't used this one for a long time. I was in this room many years ago, some years back, and I was talking to everyone, and I knew everyone was, was listening. And then I said, did anyone hear the noise outside? And no one heard the noise. Because like, when you're not interested in noise, it's, you don't hear the noise. Everyone knows this. It's like, if you live, like I live, I've shared it, like I live outside the Piccadilly Line. When I first went to live there, in that, my house in North London, I would hear the Piccadilly line all the time. And after a short while, you can't hear it. Mm. You know, you can't hear it. So when the ego loses interest in something, whether it be noise, whether it be a colour, whether it be a donut, whether it be its own thinking, whether it be its own body, these things just disappear. And if everything disappears, then what's left, you see? So, yeah. Like so, so, okay, so, so you asked me how can I be convinced? Well, you know, the, 
So as you keep doing this year after year, the observer, your experience of self becomes more and more limitless. You know, like I, you know, like I don't experience my body right now. I don't experience that I am in, I don't experience myself as I'm in this location. Because if you were doing the observer of the body for 18 years until there was no identification with the body, you tend not to experience it. Now, if someone just trod on my toe, I might experience it for a while. But now I don't, you see. So the expansiveness, so it becomes very, very difficult to point to what I am, you know. Like, are you, am I in this location? Well, if you keep going to the observer of location, keep going to the observer of time. Am I in time? Am I in location? Am I this ob Well, you don't experience yourself as this object. So it's, it's obvious that if an experience came into, you're also, every time a feeling comes up, you observe it, yeah? So if a sudden terror came up, it's obvious to me that, you know, that that would be an experience arising in the now, an experience of terror arising in the now. But the experiencing of terror, just like the experience of fear or the experience of guilt or hunger or whatever it is, is that which is being, that is always being observed. It's not, it's an object, you see. Is that clear? Maybe, it is, you don't look... It, it, it is clear. I'm just thinking of when it is so overwhelming that it's hard to observe it when it is mm. it feels like it's everything. I, I, I reckon it's something that, the, uh, that what you're saying yes. cannot really, really um, understand it through mind. Yes. It, it's because mind will always is my ego trying to understand something that it's not even it's cold. Yes. So I get what you're saying about the limit. The limits through in, in meditation happen to me. Sure. And it has happened to me in another two occasions. Talking with a sponsee. Yes. I'm channeling something and I stop feeling my body starts to get so numb and, I, and I've experienced through drugs. Yes. And that's why it kept me coming back. Yes. But it's like they say, you can go in to the room with certain drugs, you can go into the room with Buddha and Christ, but you can't stay there. Oh, yes. That's why I kept going there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think it's something that I cannot understand it through the mind. No, I agree. You cannot understand it through the mind. I, I, sorry, there's something else I should have said. Thank you for saying that. You just reminded me. Mm. So since I watched, watched Hawkins and he talked about the death of the ego and I'd had a, I'd had a white light spiritual experience with my teacher Muji uh, which is beyond, uh, which is, um, and that's also very very helpful to have a white light spiritual experience because you realize that, because I had the white light then I came into extreme bliss and ecstasy and then I went back into the body and the thinking oh. is that it's obvious that the more you let go of identification, the more into a state of bliss and oneness and infinite light you go into. So that, that's kind of uh, that. So there is. Um, so that which would arise would be the, the fear of the death of the ego. So the other thing that I, I forgot to mention, uh, which which you reminded me of, is that the commitment is to enlightenment. So every time fear arises you automatically go to the observer of it or you feel it out. And I've been doing that for 18 years. So there is a commitment to not back down to panic attacks, to surgery pain, to all kinds of hor horrible things that have happened in the last 18 years, to always go toward the observer or feel it out to get to a greater state of expansiveness. There's never, it's not been like, let me eat on the donuts or let me get some alcohol or let me put the TV on. It's always been go through. So if you keep that intention up, when you start to get the bigger ones, you automatically have the grace will take you through it. Whereas if every time you get, like if you hurt your finger and you're eating a donut or you, you, your hair looks messy and you put the TV on, if you've been doing that for a long time, you won't have the spiritual muscle to when the big ship hits the fan, 
to also be willing to go through. So it's like 18 years of the observer means when I've had, to, I've had surgery, when I've had very difficult things, like my mother recently died, I've been doing this. So it's like there's a conviction that when something really difficult happens, you'll go through it. Does that make sense? So rather than something difficult happen, I'll reach for the donut. So that also is part of the spiritual intention that, that will take you through. And it's like, um, if you've had profound spiritual experiences, then, you know, wanting to be, you know, it doesn't make sense to want to stay in a contracted state. And also, if you've been around enlightened teachers which tell you that it's an illusion, go through it, and then you'll be enlightened forever. Well, I mean, it's like, there can be great inspiration. Inspiration, well, you know, if they say it's not real, go through it, and on the other side, is you know eternal, eternal light and limitlessness beyond death for, forever, eternity. You know some of them say that you don't have to come back to this place anymore. You know if you sort of transcended the world of duality and separation. So, are you convinced? Okay, that's all I wanted. Like uh, congruence. <laughs>